South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Hi there and welcome to Headliners. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Only on CBS News Miami, the judge who presided over the Parkland school shooters sentencing trial is breaking her silence and talking about the case for the first time. Former Judge Elizabeth Scherer resigned last year following backlash over how she handled the case. CBS News Miami's Betty Wynn spoke to her for an exclusive one on one interview where she goes in depth on what happened in the courtroom during the historic case. Yes, this is the boss man. Yeah. Former judge Thank Elizabeth you know. Scher is surrounded by family in this law firm her father founded nearly 50 years ago. This is my mom, Anne, and she's the lady who's really in charge. This is where she now practices civil law, a stark contrast from being thrust into the national spotlight as the presiding judge in the Parkland School shooting trial. The massacre happened on Valentine's Day 2018, killing 17 people and injuring 17 others. It remains one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history. 11 firearm magazines. The very next day, Judge Scher was randomly assigned to the Parkland School Shooter's death penalty trial. When you got notice that you were the judge, what did you think? I was going through my docket and my secretary came in and she was like in a full panic. I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's the matter? She said, you gotta sign the Parkland case. And I said, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, it, it, was a, it, was a, it, it was a big shock, but, but not so much. I, I, I don't know, I can't explain it. I had a feeling that case was coming to me. The case lasted five years, and with it came cameras that captured courtroom drama in real time before a live nationwide audience. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. Some of the courtroom sparring, though, do you feel like it took away from the trial? Well, any time I had to, um, I guess, reprimand or censor uh, an attorney, it was, it was outside the presence of the jury. But jurors did see some of this heated exchange. Yes, um, at this time the defense rests, other than putting in our records. <laughs> We're not playing chess. I mean, will you please take the jury back in? Viewers watch the rest play out between the judge and public defender Melissa McNeil. I have been practicing in this county for 20 years. Uh, you know what? I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Judge, you're insulting me on the record in front of my client, and I believe that I should be able to. Okay, you can do that later. You can put, make your record later, but you've been insulting me the entire trial. So, blatantly taking your headphones off, arguing with me, um, storming out, coming late intentionally if you don't like my rulings. So, quite frankly, this has been long overdue. There was um, a lot of talk surrounding some of the actions when it came to public defender Melissa McNeil. Do you feel that you unduly chastise the public defender? You know, um, can I just have a minute? Yeah, yeah, no, take your time. I just need like a, like a minute to take a drink and to think about yeah, this. Yeah. Are you ready for the clap? Cher took a brief break, and when she came back... So let's get to some of the, the moments in the trial that stick out in a lot of folks' head. Okay. Do you feel at any point that you unduly chastised the public defender, Melissa McNeil? So there was a lot that was going on during that trial that I felt was extremely unprofessional and disre disrespectful, not only to the court, but to the families. As a judge, there's only certain tools that you have to, to address that type of disrespect and, um, you know, did I handle it perfectly? Perhaps not, but, I, but I, I did what I thought needed to be done in order to maintain decorum and to keep, Once one keep that, shows that trial moving in a way that was fair to all parties. Scherer says her initial hesitation to discuss certain details stems from her agreement to receive a public reprimand from the Florida Supreme Court and an acknowledgement that her conduct during trial was at times not patient, dignified, or courteous. But critics argue some of the actions by the defense team were shocking. 
When these people are upset about specific things that have gone on from that table, like shooting the middle finger up at this court and laughing and joking, Miss McNeil, be quiet. And then there was this polarizing moment. Judge, I can assure you that if they were talking about your children, you would definitely notice it. You need to sit down right now. You're out of line. In fact, you're excused. To try to threaten my children and bring up my children is inappropriate. Looking back on that, do you still feel that your child was threatened? So I'm very protective of my daughter. And looking back, I, I may have overreacted. In other words, maybe that's not what the attorney meant. But I, I, don't, I don't feel it's ever, ever appropriate to look at a judge and say, well, if this was your kid, what, I mean, that is just so far out of line that I, I will tell you he found the right but button to push. I, t I try to, to uh, maintain a level of, you know, calmness and take a deep breath when somebody's trying to sort of bait me. Bringing up my daughter, uh, you know, I, I did lose my temper. And... Um, just, just to put it in context, although I don't know that that's what was meant by it, but as a career criminal prosecutor, uh, I had, I've had three or four defendants get out of prison and come to my courtroom. They find out I'm a judge, they come to my courtroom, they sit in the back. And I think my mind was going too fast when I heard that, and I thought, well, now everybody who's watching knows I have a daughter, so anybody who wants to sort of get to me can bring her up, Or, but long story short, do I think that's what he meant? Probably not. Do I think that he was inappropriate? A absolutely. If you want to see the full interview, you can find that on our website. Just go to cbsmiami.com. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz has returned from an eight day trip to the Middle East. She says the U.S. is committed to negotiations for the release of the more than 100 hostages, including six Americans still held in Gaza. CBS News Miami's Terry Hornstein has the latest from the Congresswoman. A second bipartisan trip to the Middle East for a U.S. delegation, including Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Our purpose and our mission was to make sure that we could send a strong message to Israel and to Israelis that, uh, that the United States Congress stands resolutely by Israel. The Congresswoman says that support to help eradicate Hamas and to bring the more than 100 hostages, including Americans, back home. During the eight day trip, the delegation met with leaders in Qatar, traveled to Egypt and Bahrain, and to Israel, where they met with families of the hostages. It was important that we not just sign statements and issue press releases and, you know, be united in our position from thousands of miles away. The Congresswoman acknowledged the loss of lives in Gaza, but says Hamas is to blame. This would never have happened, and, would, and the war would not exist <clears throat> if Hamas had not attacked Israel and killed 1,200 of their, of their citizens. She talked about Israel's social media war and the evidence of sexual violence against Israelis that she says isn't getting enough attention. And very frankly, because there seems to be a, an asterisk for sexual violence against Jews. Um, it's the expression, me too, uh, unless you're a Jew. The Congresswoman says there is a lot of work to be done to bring peace to the region, but the first step, she says, getting the hostages released and dismantling Hamas. No one is safe with the continuation of Hamas as a, as a, as a terrorist entity. Terry Hornstein, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, we have an update on a story we've been following on CBS News Miami, a look inside our crumbling schools. See the work that's been done over the last year since our first reporting, next. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back, I'm Lauren Pastrana. The housing crisis continues at Glorietta Gardens Apartments in Opelika. Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, alongside city officials and representatives from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development are demanding changes to residents' living conditions. CBS News Miami's Chelsea Jones was there while they toured the grounds and brings us their reaction. We've told you about the problems here for months, the rats, the mold, the sewage, and all the other problems that residents have here, and no changes have been made, so they're still upset. And today, officials toured this place because they're fed up, too. I need justice. 
I need help. I can't no more. I can't. We can't. It's not even about me. It's not. I need help. We, we had a help. We had a help. A group of officials touring the grounds at Glorietta Gardens to see the dire living conditions firsthand. Look, right I'm getting it. Yeah. See, ready right yeah. for see. Emotions high and raw from residents who are tired of waiting. Y'all make too much money yeah. and y'all in too much power and y'all don't do nothing. Man. That's why Working we got them chicken. Working That's what we trying to get them to do something. Congresswoman Frederica Wilson says millions of dollars has been pumped into this complex for at least 20 years, but claims the property managers are slumlords. They take the money and they keep it. So while some residents have been put up in hotels funded by the city in Miami-Dade County, they still have no answers to more permanent solutions. I can't keep living and keep suffering day for day. I'm really suffering. I have to stand outside the hotel to breathe. I put in work orders out the work orders. They say they're coming to fix it. They patch it up. Next day, it's the same thing. Water gonna come all up my apartment. Right here. All right there. That's why the bag's still here. I want to see construction of workers who are licensed, who I know, who are reputable. We've had two children fall through. Representatives from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development seeing and speaking on the conditions for the first time. And we can talk about what is legally feasible for us to do. We'll have a follow-up meeting that will inform what the next steps are. Meanwhile, residents continue to wait for real changes, asking for more. A better living, just to be treated like human. Miami-Dade County has filed a lawsuit against the property owners here, and Congresswoman Wilson says she's going to be doing the same thing. As far as a timeline on when we could see changes here at Glorietta Gardens, that remains unclear. And I spoke to someone who represents the property managers here, and we have not yet gotten a comment from them. In Opelok, I'm Chelsea Jones, CBS News, Miami. Last February, our Jim DeFiti exposed the problem of crumbling classrooms at two schools in Miami Beach and the shortage of workers to repair them. So what's the situation now? CBS News Miami's Joe Gorcho went to find out. Public outcry in Miami Beach. Since I got involved, I've personally witnessed water pouring into the classrooms. Spurred a CBS News Miami investigation where Jim DeFiti discovered two Miami Beach public schools needing critical repairs last February. Exposed rebar, cracked walls, and leaks at North Beach Elementary. Floor tiles left in ruin at Feinberg Fisher Elementary. And we can always do better with the timeliness, right? Miami-Dade School Superintendent Dr. Jose Dotres told DeFiti about shortfalls in fixing schools last year. Our CBS investigation found budget cuts and staff reductions contribute to addressing repairs in the district's nearly 400 public schools. Probably like 35% short on staff that, that I could ideally have. Months later, we went back to the district, meeting with Chief Facilities Officer Raul Perez at a school construction site in downtown Miami. He explains how fixes get done if Miami-Dade's staff needs help on its thousands of open work orders. We have a team of, of private um, sector partners that we work with when these kind of matters arise. Last summer, the district addressed the critical repairs. Completed work we observed firsthand as North Miami Beach's principal happily points out there are no more leaky ceilings. Same situation at Feinberg Fisher, where we see the transformation in the now refurbished classroom. Uh, reinstalled the new floors, uh, did all the uh, all the remedial work that needed to be done. Addressing all building needs district-wide is a moving target. I want to be clear that addressing facilities needs is not something that you get done because as soon as you finish a building, you know, the one that you did 10 years ago needs uh, support again, right? I met board member and facilities committee chair Luisa Santos outside a school in her district, West Homestead K-8 Center. It's one of the latest to spend funds from the voted upon $1.2 billion general obligation bond. The bond, passed in 2012, pays for school updates and renovations. I want to hear everybody. First graders in Mrs. Castillo's class can now learn in a whole new way thanks to the latest tech advances and audio classroom enhancements in one of the new buildings at the school, funded by the bond. It really just fosters that pride of education. CBS News Miami dug into the data and found the district did so equitably, budgeting and spending more dollars fixing schools with a higher percentage of low-income kids, a plan produced by Priority 
and need. What needs to be addressed first, and that's the school that needs that, that we go to, and then we move on from there to every other school depending on that on that priority. Many schools like West Homestead K through 8 Center use the project design plans used at other schools to move bomb projects along faster. Perez says it saved nearly a year per project, and depending on the project, anywhere from 500,000 to 2 million in design costs. Check CBSMiami.com for an exclusive behind the scenes tour of the work ahead of the next school year for the new Southside Prep building. Now it's time to grade Miami Dade's bond fund spending and execution. District leaders acknowledge shortcomings in addressing repairs with less than ideal staffing. We saw the damage firsthand, but after my months long investigation examining how much they've accomplished with the billion dollars in bond funds repairing, updating, renovating, or adding to the nearly 400 hundred schools the district's responsible for, I give Miami-Dade a passing grade. Joe Gorcho, CBS News Miami. When we come back, see how a South Florida Police Department is keeping stray dogs safe while on duty and making Miami proud. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Beaches are getting a facelift thanks to a renourishment project. The timing is perfect after unusual winter storms caused erosion problems. CBS News Miami's Ted Scouten has the story from Hollywood Beach. South Florida is known around the world for its beautiful beaches. That's why the reason why we came here from Columbus in the middle of the winter when it's snowing in, uh, in Ohio right now. For the good beaches. Yes, yes. Along with normal wear and tear, rare November and December storms left our beaches in rough shape in some places due to erosion. That was right around the same time a planned beach renourishment project was getting underway, replenishing sand from Hallandale Beach to Port Everglades. We're um, doing this project with the U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to bring the beach back to what it once was years ago. Jacob Rice is a program manager from Broward County. P pretty perfect timing uh, because with those recent impacts, uh, we were able to have the project already going that can replace or put sand back that was lost recent. From Chopper 4, you can see some South Broward beaches are pretty narrow in need of sand. So every year, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, stronger storms and that certainly erodes the coastline. And so Hollywood Mayor Josh Levy says renourishment programs are critical. Big ones like this come along every seven to eight years. They'll expand the sandy beach, uh, increase you know, recreational space for everybody who likes to enjoy a day on the beach. And it's also good for uh, habitat that, you know, makes its life in the sand, whether it's sea turtles and uh, birds. And renourishment projects have economic impacts as well. If we don't maintain the beaches, then you'll have, you know, wave impacts even coming up to the buildings and structures and seawalls uh, where there is minimal beach right now. The cost for adding some 887,000 cubic yards of sand, about $40 million. That's um, being funded completely by the U.S. Army Corps. So none of that's coming out of our pocket? None of it's all coming out of our pockets. This project should take several months. It should be done by the end of March, just in time for turtle nesting season. In Hollywood, Ted Scouten, CBS News, Miami. Now to this week's Miami Proud. Most wouldn't think picking up a stray dog is part of a police officer's job description, and technically it's not. But in Pembroke Pines, that's exactly what road officers will do. The department has a one-of-a-kind animal assistance program run by one of its retired officers. It's called Pooches in Pines, and CBS News Miami's Keith Jones shows us how the group is making Miami proud. At first glance, they look like happy dogs taking a joy ride in a car. But pictures don't always tell the real story. They're abandoned dogs, picked up or rescued by Pembroke Pines police officers. And they temporarily call the police department home. I just love animals and I, it's my passion. That passion and a sad scenario that became a reality pushed this retired Pines homicide detective to make a difference. One person came in and he was on vacation. His dog got out and sent to animal control and the dog was unfortunately euthanized while he was gone. And so Pooches and Pines was born. Four indoor outdoor kennels that always seemed to be full. Angela Goodwin started the Strictly Volunteer Organization when she was a sergeant on the police force back in 2011. She still runs it today. And since the pandemic, Pooches and Pines ends up with well, more pooches than it can handle. A lot of people like would just leave them in their house when they were moved, kicked out and they would just leave a dog in their house or we're getting them tied up to um, trees. This little girl who was overbred experienced a similar fate. Yeah, this, this was around her neck. 
and this was tied to a fire hydrant over in Pembroke Gardens. And she'd been there five yeah. hours or so? About. She's certainly in better hands now, and like all the others, is well taken care of. They are fully vetted, they get a microchip, they're spayed or neutered, they get all their vaccines and whatever medical conditions, you know, that they have, we pretty much are, you know, within a reason, we take care of them as well. Pooches is run by volunteers on four shifts throughout the day. Suzanne Manessis shows us around. This is Orlando, he's our night shift. All of the dogs have a, an indoor part in the air conditioning so they can come inside when it's hot. And we can go in through here to give them their food, change their water out, that gets done two, three times a day. If we have to give them parasite meds or anything that's prescribed by the vet, you'll see it hanging up here on their intake sheet. Volunteers walk or get pulled around the parking lot, as it were, several times a day. There are cuddles, there are kisses bending over backwards for you, and they say every dog has its day. I would suggest every dog has a story, hopefully with a chapter about a new home. I just spoke with Angela, the president of Pooches and Pines. She says they are absolutely inundated over the holidays with dogs. So if you have a little room in your heart and your home, they would love to hear from you. They need donations, but they, what they really need are volunteers. You can contact them through the link that I posted in our article on our website, cbsmiami.com. In studio, Keith Jones, CBS News, Miami. Oh, they are doing great work. And thank you for joining us this half hour on Headliners. As always, keep it right here to CBS News Miami for up to the minute breaking news and weather 24 hours a day. Make it a great one.